wanted to start by talking about your Jewish uh, heritage. Mm. How do you think your Jewish heritage has impacted your life? I always thought about religion when I was young, about keeping you in your place. You know, like there's a greater cause or the universal moral golden rules. I really value the tradition in honoring my family and my father. So my dad, as you know, survived World War II. And he, um, he didn't talk about it as a kid at all. He never, actually, if there was a TV show on, on World War II, he'd come in and turn it off. And uh, we were in the back seat of a car driving from New York to Connecticut. My mom was asleep in the front seat. And I'm like, Dad, did you ever kill anyone? And he did. He shot two German soldiers. And I, I was like, he must have been like 14 or 15. He never was in a camp. He just fought with the partisans against the Germans. And at one point, he left Czechoslovakia. And he was living in the mountains in caves. Nobody knew he was Jewish, so he'd go play with the German guards soccer during the day. Uh, they thought he was adorable, so they'd play soccer with him, and, and then he'd go back into the hills, and at night he'd come down to the village and exchange stuff that women made for food. And then he walked into a bar one night when he came down, and there were two German soldiers that had stayed behind in the village, and he and his friend, they just shot them right then and there. They were going to die, so they shot them. And um, then they spent the whole night cleaning up the bar, because the Germans figured out that this village had killed two German soldiers. They would have torched the town. So he, he skied down to these villages with um, pine branches on his back. So they would race the tracks. And uh, they disposed of the bodies and stuff. But I can't even imagine. I mean, he's a teenager. And he was so weak when the Russians liberated him that he, he couldn't even pick up a gun. He was drinking the um, uh, oil from the gun, like they were drinking that, mixing it with water, which I don't think is <laughs> something that you need to do today. But I, you know, again, he, he was too different lives for him, and he wanted to insulate his kids from anything. It wasn't until I was 38 that I really talked to him about the war. When you took him to Poland? We walked to the back room of this, of this museum, and in this glass case in the back was a book, like this big, this thick, on each side, and it was open to a page of the resistance fighters. And my father's name was in the book. And it was like open to that page. And I was like, holy mackerel. It was an unbelievable moment in my life, and I, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it touches you even right yeah, now. Thinking about yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine what his youth was like, and I, I think, you know, for me, um, it was really about. Uh, it made me tough, you know. Like, um, over far, my day, my worst day was better than his best day, and and he was, um, he was tough. Uh, he had a temper, growing up. Like in what ways? Oh, he threw a plate of eggs in my face. And, um, you know, he, he would hit me with a belt, you know, as a kid. My mom was a school teacher. We grew up in a tiny little house in, in uh, Long Island, actually, until I was two. Then we moved to Connecticut. But uh, I remember that I would, if I broke something, I'd just sort of hide because he wouldn't wake me up. I'd fall asleep in the middle of the day, pretend I was sleeping, because when he got home, he wouldn't wake me up. I didn't see a lot of my dad growing up. He was always working. You know, he worked hard. He worked for... Bechtel, an engineering firm. There was a period he was working far away in Tennessee, right? Yeah, he, um, he started a company called Wonder, Peel Wonder. It was a US subsidiary of a French company. They made camping equipment and machinery that made batteries. And he did this, the office was like an old Greenwich and we were living in Stanford. My mom taught part-time, so she's the biology teacher and she taught uh, at Fox Lane High School. Anyway, he, uh, <clears throat> that business collapsed. It was pretty devastating to my dad because he had been like a very successful small businessman, traveled to China with then the governor of Connecticut, and he was like the poster child of a small business, screwed from nothing. But they had some inventory stolen, and when the banks came in and did the books, they violated their loan covenants, and mm -hmm. turned out the building that he had bought was worth more than the company. So the company was liquidated, and he was sort of devastated. I had worked there part-time in the summers, like one of my jobs was to, on defective flashlights, he made flashlights, was to save the bulb. And so um, I would throw the flashlight at the wall. <laughs> it would smash, and I'd save the bulb for the next flashlight. <laughs> Those were fine. And I worked on the assembly line with a lot of Haitian women. But um, anyway, he, he, uh, um, he got a job after that. He needs, when my mom then became, when her, all her three boys went to college, she became a stockbroker. Right. And she did that for a long time. But my dad, she, my dad couldn't get her to retire. So he got a job working for a group out of Cleveland called Park International, and he was working for the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. 
in a small town, Waverly, Texas, uh, Waverly, Tennessee, which is about, I think, an hour south of Nashville. And he would go four days a week and come back. But at that point, I already left the house. But as a kid, my dad was a car nut. And my dad would, um, I'd never see him. He'd be under the car fixing it all the time. And we would get like, a, it was a trident. I think they made eight of them. It'd show up in our driveway. He'd drive it for two days, and then it'd be gone. He just loved, he'd car and driver and field and, and all the magazines, Motor Trend. So, you know, because he, he was European and we were more American. And he didn't really, he wasn't really interested in, in, in sports that much. I was, but he wasn't. Speaking of cars, uh, the road trips you guys would take to Florida and what oh, would happen when you homework. would get worked up? <laughs> That'd be an understatement. But yeah, we were driving down and my dad would get, uh, inevitably get into fights with my mom. And uh, my dad would get out of the car. We're in the middle of South Carolina and start walking. And he'd walk for like 20 miles. You know, my mom, get in the car, Mark. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's like, no. <laughs> One time he was moving, uh, we were sitting in this, we had a colonial little house in, in Stanford, Connecticut. And my mom wanted him to move this coffee table. And he was moving it, he moved it like three, I was sitting on the stairs watching him do this. And about the fifth time she asked him to move it, she couldn't decide which room to put the table in. He stood up, he picked it up, and he dropped it and smashed it into a thousand pieces in the middle of the corridor. So, you know, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's funny, because today you're not, you're supposed to ask your children, how do they feel? What made them act that way? Like, what's the deeper meaning of their misbehavior? That wasn't part of my growing up. My dad was pretty strict. You know, you, 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 you did what you're supposed to do. You did your chores and you did your errands, and we, my mom would give me a penny if I behaved at the supermarket so I could buy bubble gum. You know, it was like, um, I don't think there was anything particularly wrong with the way I was brought up, but it's certainly not the way anyone's brought up today. Your father's bankruptcy, uh, your most vivid memory of that would be what? My father was incredibly proud, but I knew he was very hurt by, by the bankruptcy and very embarrassed. But again, he kept it all pretty close to the chest. And only when my father got older did he really become more emotional and, and we could see that, you know, he, I think he, he got very sensitive as he got older. He was probably always sensitive, he just never showed it. Mm -hmm. So one, I think, I'll, I'll never forget, we took him to see Schindler's List. And um, that was almost like a coming out party for him. I mean, after that, he was willing to talk about the war. And the kids, my kids, found him to be sort of an amazing man. And so he'd go speak at schools. And I think he enjoyed telling the story and teaching kids about the time period. And, you know, um, he was, like I said, he was an engineer at heart. Um, and he was super proud of his children. And I think he really loved the United States. And he, he really was a believer. It was the American dream. You can do anything you want if you work hard. And I know he really loved this country and the opportunities it could give you if you invested in yourself. And I think that was probably his biggest gift to me was like, there's no, there's no stopping. You can do whatever you want, just, but you gotta work. You had so. some jealousy growing up of your friends who had more. What would you think about back then? I thought someday I'd like to have enough money to buy the things I wanted to buy. Which and was like a pool and a tennis court. Right? I wanted a pool and a tennis court. That was my lifelong dream, yeah. So I would be very resourceful on how to like, there was a pond across the street. I'd catch the tadpoles and sell them to make you know, 10 cents on a tadpole so I could go buy something. I didn't have the money to buy pretty much anything. Um, so I worked. I mowed lawns. I, we had, <laughs> as I mentioned to you, we'd, we'd have tag sales and sell anything we could to raise, you know, make 10, $15. And um, I was a tennis player. I loved to play tennis. And I taught tennis and sold knives door to door. And I learned a lot of skills. I learned sort of how to be a salesman. The knife thing was particularly good. Your daughter, Adrian, when I was talking to her, she said she thinks you historically worked so hard because of her words, uh, generational trauma. What do you think it was about your parents that made you so determined? My parents, can't, in the many ways, were very, and were, are very different from each other. My mom is very social, and um, my father was not. I got my social graces and my socialness from my mom, mm -hmm. and probably my toughness from my dad. I always think about when you get kicked, when I've gotten kicked in my career and when I get knocked down, I'm getting back up. My dad got back up. He didn't let anything bother him. He built a great life. So you can't kill me that way. I mean, you just, you just harden me. You make me more determined. You're a Jewish mom. You, she wants a doctor, a lawyer. My brother became the doctor, my older brother. And so she was check on that. And then it was sort of, okay, I was supposed to be a lawyer. So I took my 
my LSATs, my boards coming out of brown. And uh, but by, by the way, this was amazing to me. You can't remember what law schools you got into, mm. yet you can remember the room count of any have hotel you memory. visit. Yeah, I can remember P&Ls, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I can remember, if you name a hotel, we had 800 hotels that started hotels, and if I owned it, I could probably tell you how many rooms are in it today. And that was 20 years ago. So, yeah, it's weird, I don't know. It's actually a big benefit to my career is my memory. Why don't I remember the law schools I got into? I know they're pretty good, Yeah. I, and I think you know I called my mom and told her, I wasn't gonna go and she cried. She burst into tears. What are you gonna do? How are this gonna work? I said, I'll be a businessman, it'll be okay. And I had taken no business courses, so. Did you feel like you were gonna be okay at that time yeah. or you were just trying to not? I don't know, yeah, I bad? did. I, I don't know why, I was too naive to know it wouldn't work out, but there was, there was no plan. I took a job as a consultant. It was the only job I could get coming out of school because I knew nothing. And you're broke <laughs> living in New York. I'm broke living in New York, I'm living in a, in a one bedroom in New York on the Upper East Side where my roommate was from Brown and we put a, we bought a bookshelf at wherever you bought bookshelves back then, the equivalent of Costco. And my roommate lived behind the bookshelf and I lived upstairs in a, in a, in a loft with a lot of cockroaches. <laughs> I remember that and no heat. But then I, 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 I left that, I became a trader, you know, an arbitrage trader. Cause I was making at that point $90,000 something. I thought it was more money than the Lord had. So, but I decided that I wanted to get an education, finish my education. I applied to two, two uh, business schools and I got into one, a wait list of the other. I don't know how they took me. I had no math courses in college. I thought it'd be the fastest in and out at Harvard Business School in world history. I was terrified of math. Why? I never took Algebra two in high school. I barely made it through Algebra one. <laughs> and how did you start to refine career direction from that point? I didn't really. I wanted to work on Wall Street actually because that was where the money was. Remember I was trying to get that pool and tennis court and I, I, I left school $8,000 in debt. So um, I wanted to get a job on Wall Street but there were, everyone had worked on Wall Street except for me. And so and you I, couldn't get a job? No, they wouldn't, they wouldn't hire me. But it turned out that Goldman Sachs was interested in me in the real estate group. And I'm like, real estate's interesting, it's physical, it's art. Um, so Goldman made me an offer and then this firm out of Chicago made me an offer, JMB. Neil Bloom, who's the founder of JMB, which was a very successful real estate firm, right. he, he left a voicemail on my machine at my school and said I was their number one recruit, and I was super flattered. So you go there, uh, didn't necessarily end well, but ends up presumably oh, being the best thing that ever happens to you because yeah, then you're... I, I, I actually, uh, you know, I worked often directly for Neil Bloom, even though I was part of the acquisition team, and. Uh, they were a very entrepreneurial firm. You know, I saw them bop from idea to idea. And I watched Neil negotiate, sitting right next to him, and sometimes not like, understanding why he was asking for crazy stuff. And um, he would ask for crazy stuff so he could give the crazy stuff away and get the real stuff that he wanted. See, like, one and one is three. I'm like, I'm like, I know one and one is not three. I'm like, good with math, but it's not three. <laughs> and I said, Neil, like, you know, one and one is not three, it's two. He goes, of course I know it's two. He says, I'm gonna give this away so I can get these other three points I want. I'm like, oh, interesting. He was playing chess and he was playing on a different board than I was. So it was, it was interesting to learn, you know, when to, when to grovel, when to capitulate, when to hold your ground, when to walk away from the table. And I learned all that at JMB. It's so actually, um, you're right, it didn't end well. The, the RTC crisis, 1991 rolls around, the savings and loan crisis, and they're virtually facing bankruptcy. And I was one of Neil's favorite partners, but then they needed to cut overhead. So they told me I lost my job. And that was kind of shocking and devastating. I was 30 years old and uh, I didn't know what I was gonna do. So, uh, I mean, I went from going to every bear game with Walter Payton and every basketball game with Michael Jordan to being like unemployed. My then wife was pregnant with my first kid. So I'm like, that was really something. What was your lowest point then? I didn't know what I was gonna do. I'm like, I'll take a job for $50,000, I need a job. <laughs> and, uh, and I had known this guy that had, I met when I was working or thinking about working for the Bass Brothers. And he said he'd back me in my own firm. And I'm like, oh really? And being fired is no fun. So you're out on your own, your first big deal, I think you triple investors money in 18 months later on. You acquire Weston, which I read an article where somebody said that was the best deal at the time in the history of U.S. real estate. Um, 
but then you know you kind of go from being this unknown person to the king of the hotel mm. industry following that what made it the most difficult year of your life? You know, we were small in the beginning. We were buying hotels using the private company, Starwood Capital, as the acquisition arm for the benefit of Starwood Hotels, the public company. And, um, but then we, we bought, we had bought half of Weston earlier, and Goldman Sachs had the other half. And then I, I wanted to buy Weston, and I had the currency, the stock price to do it. So, but I couldn't participate in the negotiations because I was on both sides. I owned half of Weston privately, and I was the CEO of the public company. So the board was negotiating with Goldman, and I was telling the board to pay less. <laughs> I'm arguing against the pricing, that they were paying too much. Because I realized it was mostly stock deal, and if we did the stock deal right, the stock would go up. And if we overpaid, the stock would go down. So the stock was 38 at the time. We announced the deal, and it trades to 54. And then, um, Hilton attacks ITT, the largest conglomerate in the world. And I realized that I am a white knight. I can save them. I have a structure for them. They merge with me, and uh, they don't have to succumb to Hilton. And, um, but Rand Ariscog, the then chairman, came up with a whole bunch of uh, anti-takeover provisions. The court shoots them down. And I get a call, Mr. Ariscog would like to see you. I walk in his office. I'm, I'm 38 years old. And he says, the company's yours. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> We're going to do a deal with you. I'm like, you're joking, right? I'm like, I'm like oh my god. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, this is a make-believe company I created three years ago, Star Hotels. And it was three years old. And we'd just done the merger. And he's like, well, we're going to do the deal with you. And I said, thank you, Mr. Ariscog, and we'll get to work. Our shareholders are so happy with the deal that 53 trades to 60. And now the deal's worth $84 a share. Um, but it's a funny story because uh, we, the, the final meeting where the shareholders would decide was at the, the ballroom of the St. Regis. And all the news wires were there, CNBC, they're interviewing people. It was like the Super Bowl. I go up in the elevator to make my speech. I have a yellow pad of my notes. And uh, the CEO of Hilton is a fellow named Steve Bolenbach. And he's very well known. You know, and I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to get blown out of the water. We have a breakup fee. If we don't do the deal, we make $240 million a fee that I was too embarrassed to ask for. One of my lieutenants did. And I'm like, you got the fee? <laughs> so $240 million, it would have gone to us. When I was 38, it would be the biggest payday of my life. So the idiot, I'm like, we should take the breakup fee. <laughs> I'll get rich, rich, rich. And, um, but I go upstairs, and I, I read why they should do the deal with us. And uh, Wollenbach, who I expected to go up, stops at $80. And, and even though our deal is mostly stock, um, the shareholders vote for our deal, and we get the company, and now I've got a problem. Because now I have three CEOs. I have the CEO of Starwood Hotels, CEO of Weston Hotels, and CEO of Sheridan and ITT. I have a conglomerate with sprawling interests. We were not in 80 countries all over the world. I have, oh, it's a pretty amazing story. We had negotiated a debt package to buy ITT, and um, it was led by uh, Bankers Trust and I think JP Morgan. And as the time was going on, they started to tighten the terms of the financing. It was like a $10 billion financing. And they said, you have to, you know, you have to, it's like a bridge loan to another financing. And I'm like, this is crazy. I can't run the firm with this gun to my head. I have to sell these assets, but I don't want to have to sell them in a fire sale. Mm -hmm. So like four weeks before we were supposed to close, I get a call or I called um, the then CEO of Lehman Brothers, Richard Fold, and he comes in and says, we will lead the financing. And I'm like, you're joking. He goes, no, we will do the whole thing. We won't syndicate it. J Bankers Trust and J.B. Morgan syndicated it. So I'm, he's in my living room in Connecticut. He came over to see me. And I said, you're going to do this? He said, we will do this. This was a huge loan, like the entire equity base of Lehman Brothers. And he goes, yep, and I bet when we do this that all the other banks will come in. So I, against the advice of the board and the CFO of our company, I throw out the financing. And I would have been the, the biggest screw up in the history of the capital markets. I, I announced the deal. I'm supposed to close and I don't have the money. And they delivered. And we got the deal and all the banks came in and we got much better financing and it gave us the ability to run the company we wanted to. But nobody's ever heard that story, but that was a, it was probably the biggest risk I ever took in my whole career. I, I kind of engineered, we we're going to sell Caesars. And with the sale of Caesars, we would split. I did call Steve Wynn, and he did offer $2.9 for the business. And I did go to Vegas myself 
and negotiated the sale of IDT with him. And that was an experience of a lifetime and a chapter in a book. And I sold it to Arthur Goldberg not to win for $3 billion. I'm on the golf course, his golf course, Shadow Creek. He's arranged for dinner for me that night. My name is on a locker between Michael Jordan and George Bush. <laughs> and I, I'm like, and I get back to my hotel room at the Desert Inn, which we were keeping, and I was one of the assets of ITT. And I pick up the phone, and Steve Wynn screams at me at the top of his lungs that I, I'm screwing him, and I'll never work a day again in this country. He'll ruin my life, he'll ruin my name. And I'm like, what did I do to deserve this in my life? I don't own the company. I'm just a hired hand here, and I don't even have a banker. Do you still remember oh, that like conversation? Oh, yesterday. Really? Oh, like yesterday. And then I said, Steve, stay where you are, I'm coming to your office. So I leave the desert and I go to Bellagio. I go to an office the size of this kitchen, twice the size of the kitchen, and there's a billion dollars of art on the walls. And Steve's there with his two German shepherds. I think he's gonna tell the dogs to rip me to shreds. And I oh, say, I, I swear to God, I'm, he's the color of a tomato. And I say, I say, Steve, here's what we'll do. You can stay where you are at 2, 8, 25, and Goldberg's at 3 billion, and the board will turn it down because it's too big a gap, and we're a public company. I can't agree to sell you this. The board has to approve it. I said, come close. Go to 2925. He's at 3 billion. I'll recommend your deal because he'll retrade us, and maybe we'll get you the company for 2925 cash. I just want a clean deal. Or I'll pay you $25 million, and you pretend that you're here, and I'll go and negotiate the best deal I can with Goldberg. I had no authorization to offer him $25 million, by the way. <laughs> so I didn't care. I wanted to get out of Vegas with my name intact, and I couldn't wait to leave the company and go crawl in a hole. And um, in walks his, I guess he was the COO or president at the time, Bobby Baldwin. And he says, Steve, can I see you? And he, um, says, he whispers, and, he goes, and Steve looks at me, comes back, sits down, and says, I'll take the $25 million. And I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> he goes, well, we forgot the overhead. Our bid is like 2.5. I said, oh, thank God. Uh, I said, I'm going to get on a plane and go home. And, uh, but I, I leave. I, I, it's a funny story. I told, I've told it recently that, that I'm taking off from LA at Las Vegas International, and there's a car chasing us down the runway. Yeah. You know? And then that, was, that was actually happening. True. Uh, true. The guy wanted me to sign it. He said, Steve wants, it was a banker, and he asked me to stop the plane on the side of the road and made, can you sign the $25 million payment? I went back to my room. I stayed at the W in New York. Goldberg was staying up uptown. I never saw him. I got him to increase his price to 3.2 billion because I knew he'd retrade us. And sure enough, he retraded us at the last minute because when stock collapsed and he was no longer really a competitor to him. And I got the 3 billion I wanted at the end of the day. What do you think you learned from the fiasco around hiring the uh, then Disney CFO to be your number two? Because you called it, at least back then, the lowest point of your life? Yeah, so I buy ITT, and now I've got this global conglomerate, $20 billion, and my, my, one of my best friends um, wants to come work with me. It was bad from the start, and then it got worse. There's a lot of things I could tell you, but I would, they would be harmful to him that I won't say. Even, even all these years later, it would Only be? Only 23 years later. <laughs> I mean, I, okay, well, I'll give you a, a hint. He didn't want to talk to our largest shareholder when he came on board. That was Fidelity. Mm -hmm. They owned 10% of the company. It was worth $2 billion. And I personally knew all the portfolio managers at, at Fidelity. He wouldn't talk to them. Why? He said he wasn't ready. And I said, they understand that. They just want to meet you. They've got a $2 billion investment in us. And they'd like to meet you. You just tell them, just go talk to him. He said, I won't talk to them. So I was like flabbergasted. And then, and then um, I walk in his office uh, a week later, there's a guy on the couch sitting like me with a notepad. And I'm like, hmm, who's this? And he goes, it's a reporter. I said, reporter for who? He goes, the New York Times. I said, what are they doing here? He says, they're doing a story on me. I'm, Excuse me? <laughs> so they wrote a story, the king of hotels. He'd been on the job, I think, a week. <laughs> and, um, and right, they made it look like he was running the yeah. show, which I, I'm sure um, if you're bothered now occasionally about press coverage, go back 20, 25 years. Well, don't years forget, I mean, like, I'm yeah. trying to figure out how to right. integrate three companies in three cities. Bo Sheridan's in Boston, Weston's in Seattle, Starwood Hotels is in Phoenix and, and, and Greenwich, and, and then ITT's in New York. So I've got a lot of work to do, and I don't have, there's no team. Like, it's just me. I got three HR directors, three IT directors, and I'm 38, and I've never done this before, and we're public, and I gotta pay off $9 billion of debt. 
So I don't worry about paying debt service. What happens if the hotels in Egypt don't pay me? Like I had nightmares about this. So I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna fail in the middle of the public market. That was probably the worst period of my, my career. Why? Because Fortune Magazine wrote an article, Divorce Corporate Style, which Richard set up. And, um, and it, was, it was awful. It was awful. It was an awful article. It was completely factually wrong. I had a guy I was hiring for marketing. He got wind of the story. He said, you need to call this woman and tell her her byline is completely wrong. I called her, but she was unmovable. Patricia Sellers. I'll never forget it, the conversation. And, and she just had everything wrong. Everything. It was a terrible piece of journalism that wasn't journalism it was just wrong and and it was devastating when it came out I was I was just and on the back of that I let Richard go that day he said to me I learned PR from Katzenberg Eisner and Ovitz you don't know anything about PR I didn't even know you could hire a PR firm like it never occurred to me to have my own PR firm I just thought I'd post numbers and be like this I was just naive and that's when you started taking more control of well I also learned in my career I learned the hard way that perception is Managing your perception is as important as reality. People perceive you differently than you think you're going to be perceived, and you have to manage your image. In Hollywood, they've made careers of having images that aren't the people. But in business, you have the same issues. I, there was another story written about me. They, there was a Business Week article, and um, I, they called me, and they said, who should we talk to about working with you? These people have left. And I wasn't allowed to sort of clean house. You know, I, had, I didn't get to pick my team. The narrative became, he's difficult to work for, so if I ever let anyone go, they just said he was difficult to work for, even if they were incompetent. And then everyone bought it. So with... with um, you said a weakness of yours uh, over the years has been not letting, yeah. uh, hanging on to people too long. Yeah. Why? I remember what it was like getting fired. But I, it's hard to fire people. Uh, I'm not good at it. And, and I, I, needed to, I needed to pick my team. I used to say that I knew that I had the right executive at Star Hotels when the pile of stuff on my desk disappeared. So when I had the right CFO, I had no more finance stuff on, on my desk. When I had the right marketing person, the pile of marketing stuff disappeared. When I wasn't worried about any of our legal issues, that pile disappeared. So that's how I judge my success, is that did my desk come clear? I hired a fellow named Steve Heyer, who was the president of, of Coca-Cola. And I was kind of, um, I mean, I honestly, I thought it was sort of an ego trip. That this company I created out of air and sweat and tears I could hire a guy like the president of Coca-Cola to take my job. And then I went out to play in a golf tournament on the West Coast, and Peter Ubroth comes up to me, and he said, what did you do? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, he ran the Olympics, and he bought Pebble Beach, and he put his arm around me. He said, what did you do? I'm like, I don't know. What did I do? <laughs> and he's like, how could you hire that guy? I'm like, who? He said, Steve Heyer. And I realized quickly that this was a really bad mistake. I hired this guy, and then he basically kicked me out. Um, Why? He, just, he was a megalomaniac. I mean, he just wanted, he wouldn't celebrate me. In fact, he dismantled my office, literally dis, like tore it down. And then he fired all the people in the company he thought were loyal to me. And at one point, he, uh, he, he had a, they've had a first annual meeting. He passed around pictures of me to the security guards because he was so freaked out that I might show up. Like, I had no intention. I didn't even occur to me to go to this thing, but I heard about it because I had a lot of friends at the company. Right. So at one point, my last deal was buying Meridian Hotels. And I said that we would, Starwood Capital would be their acquisition arm and they could go asset light. Um, they bought the management company. We'd buy the assets. And he arranged for some law firm to say there was a conflict, and there was no conflict because it was all cleared. And um, so he sort of drove a wedge. And I, I didn't want to fight. And the board said, why don't you stay? and we'll get rid of him. He was, he was pathological. Um, and uh, I said, I don't want to stay. I, I, I was having no fun. So leaving that post wasn't easy. It was time. I thought Elmer Fudd could run the company, but they fired him a couple years later. How did leaving impact you personally? I was hurt, you know, but... How, I, like, uh, how so? No, I mean, it was your baby. It's like, and then I, as he serially did stupid things, I was watching my baby, you know, emasculate himself. So, you know, I cared about my legacy, but I'm proud of what I did there. The press has said that I was fired from Starwood Hotels. I, I walked away from Starwood Hotels. I quit. And there's a 30 reasons why I quit, but I quit. But that narrative bothers you? Yeah, I'm a sensitive guy. You know, some of the articles they write about you, especially as I became more successful. They just hurt, because you know, especially when you're philanthropic and doing the right things and the press writes really bad, misguided stories about you. 
And, and um, one, one time the Wall Street Journal said I had four children. I have three children. So that was the Wall Street Journal. It's amazing when you read stuff that you know is just blatantly wrong. And most people assume it's right because they read it. Your thoughts on brand creep in the hotel industry and lots of stuff just starting to look the same? Well, I, I, I think, you know, I'm a student of, of brands. Um, and whether it's W Hotels or now One Hotels, which are growing really rapidly, I think you got to pick a niche and, and own it and, and exploit it. And I don't think in our industry, no one's ever spent less money to get better financial results. And I think the internet has really changed the world. I mean, the, the ability for consumers to be smarter and to find their own research, not like they've learned that when we take pictures of the suite and they show up at the hotel, they're like, wait, there's this beautiful room online. And I moved into this room like, where's my beautiful room? Like you got a regular room, you didn't get the suite. So for years, brands lied to people, and brands do that. Today, brands can't lie. They, they have to work, they have to deliver on their promises, they have to be what they see online. And you know, I think what we learned with One Hotels was TripAdvisor became super important. As, as our people check us out on TripAdvisor, and if we can move the hotel into the top 10 on TripAdvisor, we would demonstrate, demonstrably move market share. When it comes to design, what actually influences you? I just love design. You know, I think it makes a big difference. What influences me, I, I travel, I take pictures, they're all on my phone. You know, I, 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 I see stuff I like and I, I have a pretty good memory. So I remember I'm do, designing a hotel in Tokyo right now for one and I, I keep getting images of Zen gardens and sending them to the designer like, this is what it should look like. It's too, it's not zen, it's too overdone. I think design matters, you know, like. I mean, magazines, art fairs, galleries, everything. any of. I mean, you know, everything. I mean, I have tons of design magazines around. I, there's a magazine called Sleeper, which is hotels, and I try to read it, you know, and, and come up with ideas, find new designers, because we often work with designers, and I'm just trying to influence them and make them hopefully better. I think they feel like I've done that in their careers. I've made a lot of people famous, actually, in the hotel industry. Explain the style police. We have a style police that runs from hotel to hotel and makes sure that nobody's doing anything they're not supposed to do, and it stays, and they're like, you know, like the soup Nazi, like hey, stop. <laughs> and, and nothing's ever good enough for you from a design perspective. That's true, though, right? I can always do better. Like describe the obsessive tweaking. <laughs> I go into hotel rooms and move the furniture around. <laughs> Styling like that is an art. And this is so funny because we, we own a bunch of apartments that we own personally in a building here in Miami. And I just saw the pictures yesterday because we're gonna sell them now. And the housekeepers had pushed the chairs against the wall. They're supposed to be in front of the couch. I mean, it's it, everything, pulling the couch off the wall, 12 inches off the wall, not against the wall. It just changes the whole feel of the room. So I, I do do that. And, I, and that I, sort of stuff that some would think is insignificant. I mean, it, it is everything. It, 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 it's right. everything. It's like it just doesn't feel right. Certain spaces feel good. And I, you know, also you learn you're competing on three in 3D. It's not the furniture; it's the scale of the furniture in the space. And you got to get the scale right. You got to get the texture right. Like you got to make sure what's the feel of the fabrics. Does it feel expensive? And then you, you know, and then lighting. Lighting is critical. And I see hotels without dimmer switches. I want to castrate someone. <laughs> when you're in the room, though, like how long did it take you to develop that feel? I don't know. Like I've just had more, um, I probably, I didn't realize how important it was, you know, and then that's why I pay more attention to it. But what do you mean you didn't really, like that's what you're known for? Yeah. Among other things. It's the part, you know, my partners criticize me for this, but it's the really, it's the part I love. That's not work for me. Obviously the, the story you've told before is about the, the you know, the front of the W in uh, sh Chicago when the... Uh, the flowers. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only GM I ever fired. In 10 years running Star Hotels, I fired one GM. I didn't even pick the GM, it's not my job. But when I saw dead flowers on the way walk into a hotel, I'm like, really? That's your first impression. I learned a lot from like Ian Schrager. You know, he, uh, he put very handsome guys at the door and that, that created like, they're all look models. It was really interesting when the first W was in New York City and it was a union hotel. You can't fire the union guys, so I, I didn't know what to do with them because they weren't handsome and good looking, and I wanted to have like, I'm gonna copy what Schrager did at the Delano down the road. And um, so I got these, and they, God, I got these two or three guys that manned the door, and they were very good looking. And um, 
that had instantly made you a cool hotel. But I had all those other people, I didn't know what to do with them, so I sent them to New York Sheridan. <laughs> I got jobs there. And you'll get as granular as requiring approval on the font on the public restroom in the hotel. I mean, if they show it to me, sometimes they don't show me stuff. So I can't see everything and you know, I, gotta, I have a team behind me that, that hopefully is swimming in the same direction as me and sometimes we click and sometimes we don't. Sometimes the designers get it and they, it's really exciting to work with great design people because they stretch me and they show me new ideas and new things and I don't wanna be a cliche of myself. So I, I'm interested, like we could do every one hotel to look exactly the same. It doesn't, it'd probably be financially better, but it wouldn't interest me that much. You think you micromanage too much in that regard? I actually wish I had more time for it. I don't spend enough time on it. Um, it's, okay, it's one, there's one more dimension, cost. Anyone can spend money. Our job is to create the air that we spent money and, um, and not. When you can create a room that looks expensive and spend no money doing it, that's, that's genius. Spending a ton, hiring the finest designers in the world and having unlimited budgets is not genius. That's not commercially viable. Um, so with W, my first W, I gave them a budget of a Marriott. The W San Francisco and the W Seattle were Marriott budgets. Like we have to do this for the cost of a Marriott. And um, you know, one is more expensive because of, probably because we've just pushed, we're, we didn't really think we were gonna be a five star brand, but it's moved into that territory. The industry today, the current economy, uh, somebody close to you uh, told me things are, I'm quoting, awful, horrible, and suddenly made the business not fun anymore. Your thoughts on that? I know it's Powell. That's interest rates, yeah. We were minding our own business. Usually we screw up the global economy, the real estate industry. We overbuild the housing market like we did in the great financial crisis. Um, this time we didn't. We were just... Uh, collateral damage. We were, we were the unintended consequence. Everything we owned went down in value overnight. And it was, we can, anyone can prepare for, for changes. Um, but he told us in, in December of 21 that he would be lower longer. And he bought, he kept adding stimulus to the system till May of 22. And then he stopped. And then he reversed course and he raised interest rates the fastest in history and tightened monetary policy at the high, at the steepest in history. And I didn't think he needed to do it because again, we had too much money chasing too few goods, prices rose, but then the supply chain fixed itself and you could get your Peloton bike, you could get your golf cart, you could get whatever it was you were looking for, your watches, your used car prices fell down. So that was all gonna fix itself without him skyrocketing interest rates. And by skyrocketing interest rates, he had two victims. Two prime, three victims. One, the federal government, which is running a $33 trillion deficit and they have to pay interest on it. So if you pay interest at two, or you pay interest at five, on $33 trillion, that's a lot of money. Second, the regional banks. The regional banks were like real estate. He said, buy securities and don't worry about it. You don't have to mark them to market. You don't to, and, 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 and so they did. And then they made a ton of real estate loans in a different interest rate environment. They have $1.9 trillion of loans outstanding. And that's probably up 800 billion in three or four years, and they're underwater. So, the regional banking system is in crisis. And then real estate in general, you know, properties were trading for five percent yields, and now they're trading at eight percent yields. And if you borrowed money on the five percent yields, and, and, and yields go out to eight percent, you actually have wiped out the equity. So, um, because we didn't cause this. Um, and because it's not working, I mean, higher interest rates are not slowing the economy. People think they are, but they're not because if you look at the jobs market, it's healthcare, government, and education are adding tons of jobs. And they don't, they don't get impacted by interest rates. You don't not get sick because he raised interest rates a quarter of a point. You don't not go to the doctor because he's raising interest rates. You don't affect, your, your healthcare does not affect, interest rates do not affect drug prices. They do not affect the hospital at all. So. He's just, he's using a tool that's arcane and not appropriate. He has no other tool, by the way, for this economy as it's structured today. And he's finding that out because the, the numbers are too strong for him. And also, the federal government is spending money as fast as it can. So you have one part of the government with a foot on the brake, the Federal Reserve, and 
Powell, and then you have the other part of the government, the legislature, spending as much money as they can. What he really needs to do is walk across the street and tell Congress to stop spending money like, a, like drunken sailors. But everyone says they'll do it, but they never do it. I'm very upset with Powell. You asked me how, how uh, I just think that, and I think I've been very public, a third of this inflation index CPI is rents or rent equivalents. And so they, they randomly call 8,000 homes and they say, what do you think your house would rent for? That's the survey. You could go on rent.com or apartments.com or Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are agencies, quasi agencies of government manage, have data on millions and millions and millions of apartments. You can get that data real time. The federal government's data is like 11 or 12 months old. It's a, in a huge lag. And that angers me to no end because he didn't see inflation. Remember December of 21. Rents were flying, but it wasn't in their data because they, the, the data lags so much. So while we're looking around thinking there's inflation everywhere you look, CPI is low. And then as it starts to filter in, he goes crazy. And now rents are way down, but the data still shows rents high. And it's not academic. This is, he's affecting the global economy. They have 400 PhDs. I don't know why they don't update the rent data to current data. Food is current, energy is current, but rent, which is a third of CPI, is lagging. And, and it's now he's overstating inflation and before he was understating it. And I've been through five or six crises. This one feels the worst. Really? To me, yeah. But with regards to this crisis, when and how do you think it will end up being the worst for you and your companies? No, no, we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, the funny thing is what's bad for what you own is good for what you're buying. Mm -hmm. right. Prices are resetting. Um, and you've I, I said think, before, you want to take advantage of crisis. Yeah, I think this will be a great time to invest. You know, I think the US will grow, the economy is blessed. AI is, the pace of its absorption and productivity growth from AI will drive the US's corporate performance well ahead of the rest of the world. Like we're in a, probably a good period. It has nothing to do with whoever the president, Trump or Biden, doesn't matter. Like AI is gonna change the way we, we operate. We have power um, to drive the data centers, to drive the AI that will change the way all of us do, do work in the way the internet changed the way we run our lives, right? You'll see, it'll be unbelievable. Um, and the US will benefit from that. And there are certain parts of the real estate industry that will, are less vulnerable to AI, housing, travel, you're still going to travel. You're still going to live somewhere. Some industries will change because the tenants will change, whether it's the office market or the industrial markets. They'll, they'll be more interesting because tenants will be disruptive. You will lose tenants. They will go out, out of business. It's like the Industrial Revolution. You know, there are companies that probably made buggy whips and horses and carriages, and they're gone. They'll, we have the modern-day equivalent of that, and they'll be gone. How about your toughest singular moment during the Great Recession? Every one of these crises has created an opportunity for us. And um, 07, 08, I mean, it was, I, I don't know. I, I don't remember being nervous about my firm. I remember being nervous about the financial system, the collapse of the country as we knew it. There was an interesting thing that happened to me during the pandemic when it first started. And you can find this. I was, I was the only optimist. And I said that the world will get together. And never has the world had the tools to come up with vaccines or something that might stop this, and we will get through this. I understand you were fascinated by a recent trip to Saudi? I've been going there for, yeah, for probably eight years. Okay. Maybe 10 years. You know, in the beginning, being Jewish, you, had, you, you couldn't have an Israeli stamp, and you were nervous about going, being Jewish. Um, but I went, it was uncomfortable, it was just like my first trip to Germany. Going to Riyadh, I mean, in the beginning, they asked me to speak at a conference the government did. And I was speaking with Carl Lewis, um, the track star. And, and I, we were at the Four Seasons, I think, in Riyadh. I think it might have been my first trip there. And uh, a woman picked me up at the airport in a, is it called a habab, a bib or something? The only thing I could see were her eyes. She escorted me you know, to the hotel. I had an assistant at the time who was a woman. And uh, we went to dinner in the hotel, and they asked her to not sit with me. She couldn't sit with me, because we're not married. And uh, when we spoke in the conference room at the Four Seasons, the women were behind a screen and the men were on the other side of the screen. 
And um, they take uh, two questions from the men and one question from the woman. And today, if you go to Riyadh, it is, um, it's a revolution. I mean, women are, are everywhere. They're in government. They're driving. They're respected. They're, they're funny. They're educated because they went to school while the men were doing other things oftentimes. And the men know it, so they totally respect the women. And um, I think across the Middle East, uh, it's been incredibly interesting for me that the, the, the Muslim, Islamic population there is very hospitable. They are very nice people. And they really invite you in their homes. And they're, they're um, you know, I was, I was nervous, obviously. I mean, in fact, my, my brother, there was a, I think it was the Intifada or something. And I sent my brother to sort of meet some people in Saudi, and he was afraid to go back, and I went. You know, I'm like, I feel very safe there. So the Israeli, the October 7th massacre happened, and I decided if I was going to go to the FII con. And a lot of my friends who were Jewish didn't go, and I said, I'm going to go. I, I really feel safe and um, respected, and they're our partners. Um, and I think that uh, they really want, they understand that in, in peace is prosperity. Like, they're past the, let's have wars here. And they would like the situation to solve itself. And privately, they recognize that Hamas is not a partner for peace, that they're really just a terrorist organization hell-bent on destroying Israel. And, and they know there's 5 million, 7 million Jews there, and that's not going to happen. Like, um, th that'll never happen. So if you're going to have, and they also, like I used to wonder, like, why would they invest with me? Like, why are they giving me, I'm Jewish, why would they give me money? They, said, they know we, we're good in business, like many of us, and, or it's Mark Rowan at Apollo, or Tony, uh, Tony Ressler at Aries, or um, Steve Schwartzman at Blackstone, or even Bruce Flatt at, you know, these are, at Brookfield, these are, successful people, many of them, all of those are, are Jewish. But in the Middle East, sure, they, there was some really bad stuff. There's really bad stuff everywhere. And, and the general attitude of the, of the Middle East and the Chinese people is they have a great affinity for the progress and the culture of our country and our people. So I think uh, pushing them away is a big mistake, um, big mistake. How about the last time you talked to President Trump? That would be last two Saturday nights ago. What did you guys talk about? Uh, if you can call it talk, we, we, he wasn't happy with me supporting Nikki Haley. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, so w what, what did he say? She's not going to win, you know. <laughs> and why are you throwing a party for her? So It's a free country. So how do you handle that? I mean, that's, I'm uncomfortable just listening to you explain it. It was an uncomfortable evening. <laughs> How about the best time you guys ever had together? Myself and Donald Trump? Uh -huh. I mean, because weren't, you guys were friends kind of back in the day, right? Yeah, back in the day. Um, he'd come to all the openings of the W's, and um, in New York especially, and, and when I opened the Bach, right, he'd show up at every event. Um, and uh, you know, playing golf with him was an experience. Um, how so? He can be very charming when he wants to be, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> he could be the next president. <laughs> so that was going to be my question. Do you think he's going to be the next president? I'm going to take the fifth. I mean, I, I don't understand. I mean, if the Democrats could run anyone but Biden, and they'd probably win, and the Republicans could run anybody but Trump, and they'd probably win. And yet, I don't think either candidate should be as old as either of these candidates are. And I, I really think we need somebody who's much more uh, relatable to the youth of the country. So they, they would aspire to go into politics and, and help through these difficult times. And I just think both of these candidates are too old for the job. If they run Biden, it will be Trump, if they do that. Yeah. It's not actually a vote against Biden. It's also a vote against Kamala. You know, who, who if she's talented and capable, the administration's doing a pretty good job of hiding her from people. So the fact that they don't put her out there makes people think she's not, that she's worse than Biden because they'll put him out, but not her. So I think there's a, they, they face a huge hurdle if they stay with this ticket. And I don't, I'm not sure why the Democrats have done this. I mean, it's, whether he's coherent or not, again, perception's reality, and he doesn't look so good in public. Okay, so let me phrase it a different way. Who do you think is the next president? Graham Benzinger? Yeah. That would be the <laughs> Someone close to you was telling me that you don't get really impressed by people and you don't get angry. And then the person got emotional saying, 
if you have Barry as a friend, you only need one friend. That's nice. You know, yeah, I get impressed by people. You recently interviewed Howard Schultz. I'm really impressed by Howard Schultz. He was my business, um, I'd say, mentor, because vision without execution is hallucination. I think something like that Churchill once said. A lot of us had ideas. Executing the idea and making it a reality is just so incredibly difficult. This guy reinvented coffee. It's like we were drinking coffee before Starbucks came around. He thought he'd triple the price, and then somehow that would work. And it was a good product. It was 360. You had an emotional connection to a cup of coffee with his little emblem. You felt like you were part of a little cult. It was affordable luxury. And then he executed. I would watch him. We would open a hotel in Mexico City. He would, he'd build a Starbucks in a locally relevant design in three months. And I couldn't imagine how he could do that. And then the company was innovating bottom up. The, the Frappuccino came from the field and makes its way to corporate. And, and somehow, there's not all these layers of bureaucracy. And he, he can now roll out Frappuccinos across the world. I thought. His execution capability was so good and something I always wanted to mirror in the companies I led. But in my world of consumer stuff where brands are important, I, I, I really admire uh, Ralph Lauren. How can you stay relevant for decades with a brand that, that used to have crushed velvet and velour or whatever that stuff was that we used to wear? I mean, that's amazing. Bernard Arnault today. Like, holy mackerel. Because I worked in France. I bought a conglomerate in France. There is no tougher place in the world to operate a company than France. And there are more communists in France than there are in China. And we had them. Um, the unions fighting with each other. The, we had the Baccarat. We owned Baccarat, the crystal company. And the factory workers would get into fights with each other. Sometimes the husbands and the wives would stop talking. So the husbands made the class, and the wives packed it. <laughs> and I get a phone call, like, they're on strike. I'm like, what can we do? Nothing. <laughs> How do we make them happy? We can't. <laughs> like, I'll be charming. I go see them. I go, to the, I go to the factory, which is near Alsace Lorraine on the French border. And I sit down with the workers' council. And I said, what can we do to make your business better? And he says, monsieur, we are labor. You are management. We do not speak. I'm like, this is going well. <laughs> so I mean, I've had my challenges. So when you see execution, as Bernard Arnault in France, I mean, we, we had factories you know, that, that were, with machines that were 100 years old making glasses. And our product was, these are Bakhtarai glasses, I mean, very expensive right. versus Pottery Barn. So how do, I, how do I command that premium and how do I build it? I would have loved to held on to Baccarat. I was going to create the house of Baccarat, like Hermes. And it just, I'm a real estate guy, and I, my real estate investors wouldn't appreciate me doing that, but I, I knew I could do it. Um, and I kept, as you know, I kept the hotel license to do Baccarat hotels, partly because I was going to reinvent Baccarat through the hotels and show that they were relevant to today's lifestyle, which I think we accomplished with the Baccarat in New York. Um, so taking a pause momentarily from uh, work and uh, talking to you just about uh, personal life, what do you think you learned about yourself through your first marriage? I don't think opposites should be together. I think, I think you should marry someone that not only is your best friend, but I think likes to do the things you like to do. Otherwise, you're sacrificing and they're sacrificing. And I think that's a big mistake. I mean, you might be attracted to opposites because they're cool and interesting and different than you, but it, it, it's not easy to make that work over long periods of time. And I think uh, you know, my ex was a wonderful gal. Um, and uh, she's cerebral. She's super talented. Um, she's incredibly creative. She was a writer. Um, but we just were very different, right? My ex wasn't very interested in my career. And at one point, we saw a marriage counselor. And the, the therapist said to her, how do you feel about your husband? You don't like your husband being CEO of Star Wars Hotels very much, do you? She goes, and she said, I hate it. So you have to support each other. And uh, if you don't, then you're going to get in trouble. And I think one of the reasons, by the way, I, you know, I didn't want my kids to grow up in a, in, a, in a broken household. So I stuck around for a, a long time. And I would say my marriage wasn't awful. It just it wasn't optimal for either of us. I was talking to Adrian, um, and, and she said, you're maniacally busy, and you maniacally travel both as a way to avoid being with yourself. Interesting aging would have that. I, I'm very busy, but I also do too many things. 
And so slimming down that agenda. Also, I'm, I'm a nice guy. I get asked to speak a lot, and I don't know how to say no a lot. She also said um, it's good that you aren't just on your own schedule 24-7 now, and mm. that's uh, helping a little bit with Everybody that. Everybody who knows me wants me to slow down. So, you know, I, I, I will. Tr I'm trying. He always says he wants to slow down, and I'm like, that's bull I don't see you slowing down, but I'll like, I'll like engage in this like storyline with you. Yeah, we can all pretend you're gonna slow down. Why does he say he wants to slow down? Um, I think he says it in part because he thinks he's supposed to. It's the only way he knows how to be is to be like hyper functional kind of, yeah. um, and working all the time. It's it doesn't look sustainable to anyone. You know, it's it's a lot. I got too many too many responsibilities, um, both philanthropic, personal. I need to spend more time with my children too. You know, I'm there for them, but I'm not physically with them. We vacation as as a group. I should probably take them away one on one, and uh, and just spend time with them. How do you even figure out what that like right balance is? You tell because... me. There's no book. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm blessed. They they all turn out to be great kids. Um, I think with the right set of values, I have to, uh, you know, thank my ex-wife uh, for helping. I think our style of raising children was very different and a f cause of friction between the two of us. And I'd say that um, the reason my daughter knows me better now is I don't talk to her through the lens of my, my ex. She talks to me directly. And my ex isn't around to say, you know, interpret me. It's actually just me. I think that actually my parents separating for me allowed me to get to know my dad as an individual more. We had a few years, we probably weren't as close. Um, Why do you think that was? Um, I was angry about their divorce, but I think that like in the past couple years, we just, A, I see so much of myself in him, um, and we just have come to like really enjoy the time that we spend together. She'd bring her friends on these trips with me, and her friends would say, your dad is so much fun and so cool. She like, Really? <laughs> and then she started looking at me with a different lens. <laughs> so, you know, we'd be dancing or going out at a, cl a club or something and, and dancing on a table together. And she's looking at me like, who is this guy? I was told uh, you can be brutally honest. If she doesn't ride well and you're there, you could be like, what the hell? I, I could have been playing golf. Um, That's not true. <laughs> so Adrian had a, has a pretty, um, she's, she's very hard on herself. And um, so if she doesn't do well, she won't even talk to me when I'm up really? there. Really? Yeah. Well, She'll go in the ring and out of the ring and then don't talk to me. So, you know, I'm like, okay. so I drive an hour and a half to get there, watch her for eight, 84 seconds, and then she's not talking to me, I have to drive home. <laughs> He's like, I'll come all this way, and she'll just walk right by me, do not, not say anything, not make eye contact. Okay, and I've gotten better. Get I'm her. getting older, <laughs> and I've gotten better. I used to be, like, really bad, and I think that... Um, I used to feel a bit more of a time pressure in my riding because I had this timeline like after college of what I was going to do post college and what my like a lot of time um, to focus 100% on horses was. I told her she could follow her dreams when she got out of Brown. I did not know that she'd still be riding at this age. I did not uh, anticipate that she um, I didn't know how much her dreams would cost. <laughs> I'll always have guilt, honestly, about the, the finances behind what it costs to do this. D do you? Oh my God, immense, right? Like, yeah, and that's always like, when it's not going well, I think about all the other things that could be done, either like with my time, with m that money, right? Like how, and it, it's just like, it's for the pursuit of greatness, that's what, we're chasing, and that's what he understands. I think she's ranked seventh in the country now, so it's working out okay, and she doesn't have a great horse yet. She's making up horses to try to make this Olympic, so it'll be hard. One more year, and she'd be in great shape, but this barn is young, and she needs more time on them. She also runs the barn. She keeps her budgets, and she fires people and hires people, and it's a good training ground for responsibility for any young person. And as you know, she gets up at dawn, and and puts the hours in. You can't, like anything. Long days. Extremely long days. And, and, and it's, you know, she loves it, but it's not for me. And she's spoken a little bit about the, the kind of mental 
health challenges connected to the sport and uh, I couldn't do that. what she does. I couldn't, I need to control my destiny more. You get on an animal that weighs a lot more than you do and you're hoping it's having a good day. She may have not have told you, went to Olympic trials and um, she was nursing a, one of her, her best horse back to health and basically the horse went lame, meaning that like it turned its ankle in the, in the warm-up ring and she couldn't ride. I mean, she cried for 48 hours. <laughs> You know, just, and I, nothing you can do but just be there for her. The way you feel in that moment is, it's like the, it feels like the death of a person. It's like the death of a dream. And he's so compassionate in that moment for me and somebody who I, I think often doesn't present as like ultra compassionate in his day-to-day -day life or the business world. I hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying that. And I know he's proud of me no matter what, I really do. But like, for sure, when he comes to watch, I really want to like make him proud always. Um, what, what about that, even saying that? Uh, makes me emotional. Yeah. Um, he wants it for me just as much as I do. Um, and kind of he's always told me like, like he hopes one day that I like take over for him. So we'll see what ends up happening with that. I understand so. you could see Adrian potentially one day taking over for you. <laughs> I don't know if she'd want to do that. She's not trained in, in finance or business. She is competitive and she's a good person. My youngest son is also probably more, more capable. He's certainly more trained. He went to Harvard Business School. Adrian, uh, I could see her working in, certainly in the hotel field. In business, you just, you gotta be disciplined and you gotta wanna, you gotta want it. And I think I think she probably wants it more than a younger child, William. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I would never put anything past her. Thanks for doing this, Barry. Sure. Thanks, Pam.